everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. I've worked at the temple for the past decade now, and I can really attest to the quality of the work that they do. They're located in the Peruvian Amazon outside the city of Iquitos, about two hours outside in the jungle. Uh, it's a beautiful environment. They run 12-day workshops in which they have six different ceremonies. Um, they work in the lineage of a group of people called the Shpibo people who have a really long uh, tradition and lineage of working with plant medicine, especially ayahuasca. Um, and in those six ceremonies, they're working with four different uh, Shipibo doctors, healers, corenderos, uh, three facilitators. There's a yoga teacher. There's an amazing support staff, an amazing integration team. So it's really just a, a beautiful place to go really deeply into this work, whether it's the first time you're you're looking to work with plants or it's something you're, you've done in the past and you're looking to go deeper. Uh, they really create an amazing environment to do really deep work. So uh, they are open now. Uh, they've been open since uh, August of this year. Uh, if you'd like more information, you can check out their website at templeofthewayoflight.org, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Also, my friend and colleague Marav Artsy and myself are continuing to run dietas uh, in the Sacred Valley of Peru, also in Egypt. Uh, that's a really amazing opportunity to go really deeply into this world of plant medicines, uh, to experience the, the power, the beauty, the, the healing capacity that these plants have, uh, going into a period of isolation, of really restricting one's uh, food intake. And uh, experientially working with these plants, especially through the medium of tobacco, which is a, a tradition that, that we were both trained in. Um, and it's, uh, it's a really beautiful opportunity to experience the, the three levels of, of how these plants work, working on the, the physical body, the mental emotional state, and the, that connection to spirit. So if you'd like more information about that, you can check out my website at nicotianarustica.org and also Marav's site at tobaccodiets.com. My guest for today uh, is my friend Ido Cohen, Dr. Ido Cohen. Uh, we were actually introduced through a mutual friend, Deanna Rogers. Uh, I have I had worked with Deanna for a, a number of years in the Amazon, um, and she introduced me to Ido. <clears throat> uh, we first uh, I actually did a, an interview with Deanna, and then we did a, another interview as kind of a collaborative effort. Uh, with Diana, Ido, and myself. Um, so if you're interested in either of those, you can go back. Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but uh, Diana Rogers. And then the second interview was with Diana Rogers and Dr. Ido Cohen. So I thought it'd be really interesting to have Ido back on as a solo interview and uh, talk a little bit more deeply about some subjects. Uh, we ended up having a really fascinating discussion about uh, polarity and archetypes and masculinity, femininity, the and the, really the archetypes. Of, of those two energies. So uh, it was a really fascinating uh, conversation. We also talked a little bit about plant medicine integration work. So uh, it was actually uh, uh, probably one of my favorite uh, podcasts just because of uh, some of the depth and, and topics we discussed. So uh, I think you all will really like this. Um, as always, if you're able to support the podcast, Patreon is a really beautiful option. It's a subscription service. Um, there's different tiers you can sign up for for as little as a dollar a month, uh, and that's a really big help to me to continue to bring on these guests, to, to produce these shows. Um, and with Patreon, there's some perks that you get back depending on which tier you sign up for. Uh, to all of the people who have done that, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. That's a really big help. Uh, and if you are able to do that, that's, uh, that's deeply appreciated. Um, there's also now with uh, YouTube the ability to join the channel. Uh, if you're watching on a laptop or a PC, uh, below the video there should be a little join button and that offers basically the same perks as the Patreon option but just via the format of YouTube. And if you're not able to help out financially, um, simply subscribing to the show is a really big help. So with the YouTube channel, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help with the algorithms. And if you're listening on the audio version, whatever format you're listening to, uh, Apple Podcasts is still the biggest one, uh, 
But uh, following the show and leaving a starred rating and a short review, that's a really big help. So I think that's it for the intro. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Ito. I'm running out from the maze. Running out from the maze. Running out of the maze today. Running out from the maze. Running out from the maze. Running out from the maze today. I'm running out from the maze. Running out from the maze. Running out of the maze today. Hi. <laughs> yeah. So welcome. Yeah. We, so we, we were catching up quite a bit before. I think we were talking for like a half an hour before we started recording. Um, okay. But we, we, we came up with some interesting themes we, we were going to talk about. Um, but I guess just quickly, welcome again. Um, it, it's a, it, it's nice to have you. Uh, you were, you were highly recommended by Diana, who, who I also interviewed. And then we did a, a collaborative interview together with, with you and her. And uh, so we decided to do one uh, just with Ido. And uh, <laughs> so if anyone is is uh, interested, they can also go back and watch the previous one uh, to get a better feel of you. Um, but we were we were actually just kind of talking about some of these uh, archetypical role archetypal roles. I always get that confused, but archetypal roles of, of masculine and feminine. And you started telling me this story. Uh, you were recently in New York. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, good to see you, Jason. Thank you for having me again. It's always a pleasure. Um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that, and I'm curious for us to talk about the the Shipibo version. I was in New York now, and I was in the show called Minimality, which I highly recommend anyone who's visiting or in New York. Um, basically, what they're doing is that they're putting you. Um, they had built this setup where you go into a very meditative space and. It's a blend of storytelling and virtual reality. And they did a phenomenal. I, <laughs> I came and I was like, you know, liminality is such a topic. It's so hard to really explain it. It's so hard to like try to, it's something you have to feel. You can read about it for days on days on end, but you really have to go. Um, I think it's if you were in for you really have to go through a transformation process or like do a lot of very deep work to be to feel it in your body so i think it's very appropriate for like this conversation because i think plants really put you there and shamanism is a whole liminal space or a world on its own but anyway they put you in uh so they tell you there's storytelling and then they give you this cue and you put this vr set and you get immersed in this other story and they, uh, I was just about to say, I came and I was like, oh, okay, they're, they're gonna, it's going to be hard tackle this. Like, how are they going to, it's going to be a nice experience. But I was really, um, I was mind blown. They really did a good job of putting you in that space that I think a lot of people who do psychedelics, plant, plant work, or any kind of deep transformation work can identify with, where they put you in the space that you're starting to doubt what you know and who you are, but you don't know what's coming and what you're going to become. And you're kind of hovering in this in-between space where you're very, very open, very, very sensitive. There is, you move between disorientation and insights between feeling solid and then feeling totally fluid. Um, and I remember there was one story that started with what sounds like a shipwreck. And you hear this voice saying, asking itself, like, am I dead? But if I'm dead, then how am I thinking? And they just keep putting you in this in-between stage. Um, and I was thinking of, I was, I just noticed myself going through these waves and waves of emotions. And I it really, at some point I was like, wait, this is starting to feel familiar. Like I know this feeling where you go through a wave of emotions and then you kind of land somewhere and you take this deep breath and you're like, wow, what was that? And you, it feels like a cycle. And I was like, this really feels like my ayahuasca experiences. This is really peculiar. 
And the last VR sets that, so they take you through like climate change and the story about love and then the story about um, a cave that, Basically, there's a narrative that's from a cave's perspective of how it's both for something that's for destruction, but also for life and so on and so forth. And the last piece is that you go into this VR um, VR environment and there is this, it's, it gets clear that you're starting in, an, um, in a womb and there is this small pulsating seed. And slowly it starts to kind of illuminate itself and grow and grow and grow. And then the environment starts to change and you go into, uh, you see this whole network of, of strings of lights. And it's like, oh, it's a neural system. So it's like your brain. And it starts talking about anxiety and what causes anxiety. And then, yeah, it was beautiful. And then all of a sudden this neural pathway like changes into a nebula. And you see how they're very, very similar. Um, and there's this voice that comes in and starts talking about, you have the greatest gift, uh, which is the gift of consciousness, the gift of conscious being. And by that point, I was like, okay, this is for sure some of that was experience. Like, like, this cannot, <laughs> this feels too familiar. And they take you through these beautiful landscapes of, trusting mother nature and being immersed in mother nature and you're floating through these different landscapes and there's this incredible I felt like it's incredible feeling of serenity and peace and calmness this this unshakable calm um, do you have like a like VR goggles or something on or? yeah so they give you this that you have them next to you and then they tell you a story and they put this like um move you through sound and story, and then they'll give you this cue and you put the VR. So they move you in and out on these different sensory experiences. So you have this speaker in your back, so your body is reverberating, and then you're hearing and you're seeing, and then they put you, they immerse you in this VR and you come in and out, in and out of that. So it's a very, very multi-sensory experience. It was pretty incredible. Um, but what was interesting is that afterwards I contacted them and I was like, just wanted to tell you what a great job you did. Like, it's phenomenal. As someone who's interested in these kind of like psychedelic archetypal realms, like um, you've done such an incredible job. And they were like, oh, what do you do? And I started talking to them. And I said, you know, it really felt like, you know, I, I'm very influenced by Jung and like uh, plant shamanism. And they said, I hope I'm not outing anyone <laughs> that's organization, but they're like, actually, the show is very influenced by plants. And, and, and I was like, okay, it's very, very felt. It is very, very felt. And that's been where I've been kind of swimming in, like, what is the different layers of what's feminine, like what we talked before we started recording. What is feminine? What is masculine? Um, I think the importance of that for... I don't know, it feels important for us to talk about that when you do such deep transformational work, right? Because I think a lot of men are, first of all, we have to move them away from gender. That feminine is not just about being a woman and masculine is not just about being a man. And I think there is so much, we have so much baggage around what it means to, to have more femininity inside of me if I'm a man, what it means to be, have more, masculinity inside of me if I'm a woman, what it means to be actually if I want to be more androgynous or more fluid. And how does that relate to, yeah, to the process of healing? And so that's one thing I've been thinking a lot about. And the other thing is the importance of, and I think maybe it's part of what we already started talking about, the importance of being in how do we allow ourself to be in a space of not knowing of liminality because it's the inevitable part of, of any change process and yeah how do we how do we talk about that how do we find a way to be in that to allow change or transformation because it's terrifying to be in true liminality 
And anyone who's done any, I think, let alone a plant diet or any 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 spirit psycho spiritual practice for long enough knows though I think we'll know those moments where you're like, oh, what happened? I mean, I think you kind of even described it after you know my me saying after one of your experiences coming back and noticing that something is different but not knowing what it is. Right. And noticing that people are responding to you differently but not knowing why. And I think it's so easy for our mind to find, try and find a reason like, oh, maybe it's because I'm this or this happened and this and how that actually forecloses. It closes up a space as opposed to just staying in, the, in that, for lack of a better word, like this birthing space. I'm like, I don't know why it's changing, but something is happening. And let alone, I think for this work, what happens when I'm starting to change and it's so opposite to my construct of self, right? Which is, this work is all, any type of transformation work, it's pretty much what it's all about. It's transformation, your idea of self. And we all, you know, it's, a lot of people that I work with are like, I really want to change. But I also, they don't say it like that, but it's like, I hear it. And I'm like, I want to change, but I want to stay the same. I was like, well, <laughs> that's, how do, that's a paradox. Like, how do we work with that? Right? And what are you actually saying when you say that? Like, there is a, for me, it's this feeling of how do I change? I want to change, but I want to feel safe. I want to maintain some sense of stability and familiarity. And I don't know if it works that way. I'm not sure it can, it can work that way. If you really want to change, it means you have to get go of that stability. It's not about letting go. It's not going to be a queer choice. Someone's going to take it from you. <laughs> the process is going to take it from you. And how do we open up to that? Especially, you know, with this big questions and something you referenced too about us potentially moving in this huge direction of change in the collective. Right? I talked to a friend of mine who, sorry, but was a practitioner yesterday and she was referencing this teacher that she's working with. And she's like, you know, we talked a lot about everybody wants to go back to normal. And what is that wish? What is that hope? What, what, what is that normal? And how does that work if we want to change the world? And you and So that's, that's where I'll be traveling. <laughs> <laughs> How, how would you describe that, uh, that, that word luminal or luminous? Like you kind of referenced this, this, this space of the unknown. Is that what you think that's pointing towards? I think for me, liminality is when you go, when I was, I was in New York class two weeks ago. For me, liminality is being on the airplane. You're really, you're in between. You're in between spaces. You're really, you're not where you were. You're not who you were. You're not in the familiar environments, but you haven't arrived anywhere yet. You're not where you're going to. You're it's kind of in this space, open, hovering, expanded space where there is yeah, it's really, it's like the, the, uh, the structure of who you are is starting to kind of slowly open up. There is almost like a, excuse me, a disintegration process. There is permission for space to kind of, if we walk around with this, this is our idea of self. It's this firm, structured, connected, you know, Dots of this is who I am. This is how I see the world. This is how I relate. This is how I experience things. All of a sudden, it opens up. So for me, liminality is is that space in between. It's like your identity is starting to get looser. And when your identity starts to get looser, the way you see the world starts to change. The way you experience the world starts to change. Um, 
your sense of I, you know, your sense of I-ness starts to come into question. And it's fascinating because if that comes into question, it's like, that's why I love that story from that show. If I'm dead, then who's thinking? If my identity is into, coming into question, who is that that's reflecting on the fact that I'm changing? Right? So, like, you know, here we all, yeah, it's the observer, but who, who is this observer? And who is this that's freaking out because I'm not who I was yesterday? And who is that that's able to say, like, ah, oh, look, I'm really freaking out? So for me, liminality, it's, it's that space where all these <clears throat> processes start happening. And it can be long-term. I think, you know, we were talking about diets before. So I think in a diet, that probably happens a lot. You start going into a very expanded, slow states of liminality. I think it can be short-term. I think it can be, uh, for me, like a really good therapy session puts you in that space, even if it's for 20 minutes. A yoga class, a meditation practice, a run, and let alone like a plant ceremony experience. That opens you up where there is this permission that you take or <laughs> is given to you by force to kind of start like wondering. And, you know, I th you probably can probably talk a lot about that. Um, you know, even I think in the psychedelic community, people say, well, ego death, ego death is like an experience of liminality. I have a whole thing about ego death. I don't really think you can kill your ego. I don't think you should, though. Um, but yeah, ego death can be a liminality. Um, and I'm curious, I'm curious, Jason, I'm sure you've seen it in people that, you know, you work with where all of a sudden they become so open that, you know, usually it shows up in this confusion or fear or doubt or even paranoia, like, oh my God, I don't know who I am anymore. Right. And how... That's where the feminine masculine for me comes into play because from what I know, the idea is that the only that when you're in that space, the only thing you can do is create a container to hold that space. That's it. Right? Which is a, for me that I associate that with the feminine. It's creating this womb, this cave, this container to just create this holding. It's not about making sense, it's not about interrupting, it's not about analyzing, it's not about okay, let me make insights and, and create this firm ground that I can grasp on. That feels very masculine. So I'm curious how you see that in your, you know, because we were wanting to talk about uni and kawa and like all that, but how does do you see that in your work? Yeah, it, 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 it's fascinating. I mean, because it's a, it's a huge topic. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, all of these things, uh, you know, polarity, and and that's I think what what so many of these traditions are pointing towards. And and as you said, it's that that luminality, that space in between, where those polarities begin to 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 dissolve. And it is it's very scary because that's the polarity is the world made manifest. That that's everything we we think to be real, and mm -hmm. in a sense is real. And yet in that space in between, all of that falls away and, and there's nothing left to grasp to. Um, I mean, it, it, it's interesting because you use the, um, this idea of, of like that space holding as a, a, as a feminine quality. And it's interesting because I had actually never heard of it in that way. And, and yet that, that makes sense too. I think often the space holding is actually more represented by an architect typal masculine quality um, in the way of like, you know, if you think of like, who's, who's holding up the world, it was Atlas or the, the, the pillar, the, the support structure, the, the, the beams of the house, the, the, even the, the patriarchy. I mean, that's often these days it has a negative connotation, <laughs> But it it comes from a very positive place, which is like Pat there, father. You know that the father mm -hmm. is the support structure. It's the it's the pillar, and yet it's it's the feminine. That's the dance. That's the movement. As we were talking about a little bit before, like the light. Um, 
And it's interesting because even in the ayahuasca um, um, stories that I've heard, it was interesting because I remember one time um, giving like a, a plant walk with some of the Shipibo and uh, the, this lady asked, well, why is ayahuasca called ayahuasca? Because if people aren't familiar, ayahuasca is a brew consisting of two different plants, uh, the ayahuasca vine and uh, the, the plant, which in, in Spanish is called chucruna. Um, but it's a little confusing because the, the, the vine is one of the two plants and that's called ayahuasca and the, 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 the other plant is called chucruna and yet the brew is called ayahuasca. And she was saying, well, this seems very like masculine because why, <laughs> why did they choose the masculine name to, to call the plant? Like, why isn't it called Chikruna? Wow. Um, and <laughs> there's probably, this, this probably we're, we're going to get a, a little dicey, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think because in that way, like they, they speak about it also in Chinese medicine in, in like the archetype of yin and yang. And they would actually say the yin is the light, uh, much in the same way as ayahuasca, like the, the chukrun is the light. It's that which gives the vision, uh, and which is what often people really associate with ayahuasca is like this visionary experience. And that's coming from the feminine. Um, mm -hmm. And but the, the interesting thing is even within the ayahuasca system, that, 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 that plant brew, the feminine can't work without the masculine. So in, in that way, it's like the masculine is there first to allow the feminine to work. It's holding the space. It's, it's, it's giving the effect. Even, you know, even if you look at it in a more scientific way, like that is what's happening. And it's like the, the, mm -hmm the chakruna plant has the DMT. It's, it's, it's that which gives the effect. And yet it can't work because there's something inherently in us when we ingest it, this monoamine oxidase inhibitor that, that inhibits that. So it has no effect. So it's the ayahuasca vine that, that uh, inhibits the, uh, or sorry, it, it inhibits the monoamine oxidase um, enzyme in our stomach that then allows the, the DMT to have an effect. So in that way, like the ayahuasca vine is the space holder. I mean, they talk about it in, in like a, a Judeo Christian sense of, of like Eve came from the rib of Adam. And, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes, you know, we look at that as well, that's patriarchal, it's bad, but I think there's a very deep meaning in that much like in the Chinese system, they would say it's the yin that, that like does the effect. It's that which gives the light, but they would say it's really important that the yin never tries to overtake the yang. Because if it does, it creates an imbalance. It creates a disharmony. Um, I think in, in Shipibo, it's actually uh, probably more uh, easy to digest in a way because uh, ayahuasca is, th those, are, those are Quechua words, uh, ayahuasca. Um, in, in the Shipibo language, the brew they call uni. And so someone who works with uni is an onaya. Uh, and, and that word is often translated, it has some, some idea of, of knowledge or wisdom, um, but they would be very specific too. Like it's not a knowledge that you can pick up in a book. It, it's, and, and I think that's where wisdom comes from. Like wisdom, mm -hmm. maybe we can read it in a but really it, it has to be something that's, that's experienced. And so some people would, would translate uni as knowledge. I think probably wisdom is like a better, a better translation um, or one who knows, but, but very much in, in the Greek sense too, like from, from what I understand in Greek, there's two words for knowledge uh, and, and gnosis is the knowledge that comes from an experience. It's something that can't be learned in a book. They have a different word for knowledge that comes from a book. Um, so in Chipibo, the brew is called uni uh, and the two plants each have a specific name. So the, the vine is called nishi, the ayahuasca vine, and the, the chikruna plant is called kawa. 
And, and so when these plants are combined, one experiences uni or knowledge, wisdom. And because uh, you were asking me earlier the, the story, and I've heard different stories, but they, they tend to, to kind of be similar. Um, but that essentially they would say like long ago in, in the jungle, there was this family. And, and actually they would say, interestingly, people didn't live in communities, like communities are more of a recent innovation that, that in antiquity, people lived as family units throughout the jungle. And that there was this one particular family that had a really strong connection with, with plants, with nature. And uh, one time the, the, the husband, it was a, it was a, a husband, a wife and their three children. And the husband received this premonition through the dream space, which I think is, as we were talking a little bit about tobacco before, um, in, in all of this shamanic work, like that dream space is, is vitally important. That's where wisdom or knowledge is also received or experienced. And, you know, like you were saying, it, it's this fascinating thing because often we disregard dreams as, as if it's just something that's happening. And yet, as you pointed to, like, we're still in the dream. The consciousness that is me in this waking reality is the same consciousness that's there in the dream. It's experiencing all of these things. And, and I think that's also where like that luminal space is so valuable because in that space, we see that it's still the same thing, that this reality may begin to fall away <laughs> in the same way that it does in a dream space. And yet we're oh, still present. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, so I think that's also a significant part of that story is that in that luminal space, in that dream space, uh, the, the, the father had this premonition, the husband, that he was going to die. And so he told his family <clears throat> and, you know, they said, no, you're young, you're healthy. Don't worry about it. It, it was just a silly dream. <laughs> and sure enough, he ends up dying. Uh, but before he died, he he said, you know, instead of doing the traditional death rite, I want you to take my body and place it at the base of this tree. And so they, they honored his wish and they, they put his body at the base of this tree. Um, I've heard they, they put it like in a, a big uh, clay pot. I've heard they just laid it at the base of the tree, but in, in whatever way he was at the base of this tree. Um, some time went by and then the mother, the wife also had a similar uh, experience in her dream state where she knew she was going to pass away. And she told her children, similarly, they were like, you know, mother, don't worry about it. It's just a dream. You're, you're young, you're healthy. Everything will be fine. She also ended up passing away. Um, I've heard where they, they either put her body at the base of this plant. I've also heard where they put it in the center of the Maloka and the, the Maloka being um, not only the, the, the house, but it's also a representation of the earth, of, of the universe, mm -hmm. of the world. So, that, so her, her body was placed in the center of the world in a way, in, in a metaphorical sense. Uh, and so then the, the three children had no parents, so they had to go off and live uh, with, with other family members in a distant place. Some time went by where they came of age and then in, in their vision, they had uh, this, this, this knowledge that was told to them that they needed to go back to where they had uh, placed their parents. So they went back to where they put their father and there was this vine growing up this tree. And they went back to where the mother was and there was this beautiful plant growing out of the ground. And they realized that they needed to take those two plants and to combine them and to ingest them and to experience that. And that was the beginning of uni. And there, there's all sorts of metaphors there. Even like in a, in a Christian sense, there's the, they're taking the, the, the flesh and blood of Christ in a way. And, and even mm -hmm. as like the, the Catholics say, like, that's not a metaphor that's meant to be real. Like it's, it's not a symbolism. They're literally taking the, the blood and body of Christ as a sacrament mm -hmm. to experience Christ consciousness. Um, 
So I find that like a, a very similar metaphor, like they're literally taking the body of their parents, of their father, their mother, the archetypal, the, the literal, but also the archetypal. Mm -hmm. They're combining those two to experience knowledge. Um, and then from, from those three children um, arose in, in the Shpibo way of looking at things, the three uh, archetypal curanderos or healers, the, the Onaya, the the yoba and the mordaya um and i won't go too much into that because because that's another story but but just essentially that, that that's where that's where like knowledge or wisdom came from that was the story and 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 also really symbolic because it is it's it's um it's archetypal in those polarities it's the masculine and the feminine and it's only through the joining of those through those two polarities those two forces which are or equal and opposite that allows a true wisdom to, to, to emerge. So, you know, I, I think there's a real beauty in that story, which, which very much uh, points to the, you know, the importance of, of, of masculine and feminine. And as you said, it, it, it's not that like a man would tend to embody more of those masculine qualities. A woman would tend to embody more of the feminine qualities, but we also carry both. I mean, that's also the the, the alchemy, the transmutation, mm -hmm. the, the transmutation of base metal into gold is, exactly. is bringing those two together. Um, but but there is a real, you know, in the Spibo way of looking at things, there is a real sense of 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 those different qualities of the different qualities that that they hold and you know even uh, uh, we were talking a bit about before of the work with tobacco i mean that's that's something i've 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 really seen through my work um not only working with a lot of people that's also why i chose to work with marav is because i've really seen kind of how how those two forces really are beautiful but that each of us in our in our, our 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 manhood or our womanhood, we do carry different energies, uh, which are are amazing and beautiful. And actually, I think a, a lot of our suffering, in a way, comes when we begin to forget that we begin to to forget the story, in a way. And that's uh, I also mentioned this guy Amika, who I have a lot of respect for. Before he works with any plant, you always tell the story. So you sit around in a circle and, and, and the story of every plant is always told. And, and I think that's a beautiful thing. One in that it, it in a way de facto makes these plants non-recreational <laughs> because there's always a ceremony around it. There's always a storytelling. Um, but he would often say that the, the problems that humanity have, have faced are because we've forgotten our story. And that actually even the primordial suffering of humanity is we, we forgot our story, our collective story, our story of, of who we are, where we come from, uh, what it means to be a human. And that, that actually there was this deep calling, this deep longing. Uh, interestingly, in, 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 in his culture, they say this, this call was answered from the, the star Sirius. And that mm. this knowledge came down in this primordial, primordial anaconda canoe. Uh, which carried all of these plant medicines and the plant medicines helped people to remember who they were, uh, where they came from. And as he would say to transcend, we were also talking about uh, the number 12, uh, the 12 dimensions of time and space uh, to eventually be able to go home. Mm. So, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I want more story time. Um, I mean, yeah, you said, there's so much in what you said, but I'm thinking about when I was uh, diving deeper into liminality, I found this, uh, there is this Jungian analyst called Murray Stein who wrote this beautiful piece and something you said really resonated. He writes that when things are going by plan, <clears throat> which means when you're living a more controlled ego led life, he says, the soul is sleeping. The, the realm of the soul is sleeping and it's faded and vague, just like the moon and the star in the stars when the sun is out. So just as far as right, where you said about, yeah, the, the, 
waking up to a dream as opposed to waking up from a dream, right? Waking up to that reality of liminality, of openness, of, um, of embodied wisdom. And that's also interesting because in Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah, wisdom is feminine. Just like what you described, wisdom is considered feminine. Knowledge is considered masculine. And it's the combination of both of them that creates something that I can't translate into English because I wouldn't know the word. But you're making me think about, yeah, it's exactly, it's the, in, in feminine, masculine terms, right? What, what I'm hearing from you and what I'm thinking is that we have to create something, the union, the alchemy is to create something more androgynous meaning that we have more flexibility to move in between these spectrums. But we're so culturally wired to think of androgyny as something so, there is so much stigma and so much, maybe even misconception about what androgyny is. In India, for example, there is this, um, when someone would be born with, out specific genders, um, um, like you wouldn't know if it's a boy or a girl because maybe they had a little bit of both as far as like their like organs. They be called idras, and they would actually be considered holy, and they would be put like they would be raised by other ones. Like until I don't know how many hundreds of years ago, but every birth, one of those one the nidra would come and would be at the birth. And if the baby was born in Israel, they would be taken away and be raised to be considered as a whole, as whole. Now, when you go to India, they're like, they have been stripped away to being basically, to being something to be ridiculed, to be something to be made fun of, something to be even more interesting to be afraid of. When I was in India years and years ago, and I would see them on the train, everybody just did not want to, just didn't want to deal with it. Right, and that's just I think symbolic to um, that's our call, like our psychic attitude towards these things. I think that's what makes healing so powerful and so challenging. Because how do I not re react that way? Right, as a man, when I'm opening up to the feminine, which means the fluid, the dancing, right. Um, and there is a beautiful article by Jacques Mavitz, who you probably know from Takiwati, right? He wrote about um, looking at 30 years of experience with, with uh, people who have addiction. He's like, addiction is predominantly, he says, but because of the disconnect from the imaginal, symbolic, um, spiritual aspect of life. Now, he doesn't say it's feminine, but I would say, yes, it's opening up to the feminine opening up to the unconscious, to things, to dreams, to symbols, to visions that are so outside of my, my ego structure of self. And I allow it. I allow it to change me. I allow it to experience me as opposed to me experiencing them. I allow them to kind of sip through my body, right? Just like the plants do. When you, I remember my first ayahuasca experience. I remember this feeling something is like walking swimming inside of my veins, inside of my bloodstream, and noticing these responses like, <gasps> oh, oh. right, there's something inside of me that I can't control. And for me, yes, obviously that's natural in some way, but it's also a reflection of, okay, so what? Like you chose to participate. You chose to be in communion. You chose to be in communion, in, com in connection, in conversation with this plant. Why should that freak me out if I wasn't trying to hold any some sense of control, some sense of, again, maybe the word is stability, as opposed to just like, okay, let me, op let me choose to open up. And I find that to be really, really hard because, and understandable, but because we are so, most of us Westerners are so traumatized personally, by our personal stuff, by, by cultural structures, by organizations, by cultural attitudes, that the idea of letting someone else enter you, both symbolically and literally, is terrifying. Right? I can, there's something that I can, we can go in there, like, 
which is the, for me, that's the idea of intimacy, right? What is the true intimacy? It's not the ability to be in a relationship with someone who you actually give them access into you symbolically and emotionally. You're letting them influence you, letting them impact you. So how do we go into, right? And that, again, back to liminal space is when you open up and you let the, whatever it is that you're in conversation with starting to impact you. And how do we hold, how do I work? How do we create a space where that's the reflection? It's like, oh, look what happens when you're being impacted. Look what happens when you're starting to change. Because usually for most of us, we just contract into, well, if I, re if I feel this way, then the feeling is real and I should deal with it. Right? If my partner told me something and I feel hurt, then obviously she's the one who hurt me and I'm the one that's been hurt. That's the problem. As opposed to, wait, right? That's why that's <laughs> when it gets to couples therapy, it takes a while to get to like, oh, wait, maybe it's, she said something and it stirred something in me. She, right, my partner, she, he, they entered into me and stirred something. And it's not really about them. It's about me. It's about how that interaction impacted me. Right, gnosis. It's about how all of a sudden I'm having an embodied experience of something. And can I, can I work my way into experiencing it first before I make any conclusions about it? Can I allow the plans? Can I allow this person? Can I allow the universe to impact me before I make a conclusion? Before I say, well, it's because of this. And that's why I've been so fascinated with and I, I don't have any answers, but how do we, right? How do we create that space? And I, I, there's something you said about is, is the holding container, is it feminine or masculine? And I, I love that you have that version and I have this version because I'm like, we're, we're both right. And that's where it becomes more interesting. And that's, for me, it's where it becomes more potentially like a clue for us it's a clue for us okay so what do i need what kind of holding maybe it's not what flavor the container is but it's like okay what holding do i need in my in this moment do i need compassion do i need um to be to be held do i need kindness or actually what i need is i need to sit up straight Right. Like I was taught, at least in like when you're going through intense vision in the ceremony, sit up straight, straighten your back. So the energy flows a certain way. So there, I mean, I can think about it symbolically. So your spine is straight, right? That's for me, that rings very masculine. Right. Sit up straight, focus, be clear, right? So it's like really, and that when we have these, uh, these, frameworks we can start working we start navigating the space more consciously and i think that's part and you probably can talk about it better than that's what we're still transferring from eastern star like indigenous traditions to the west it's these frameworks All right i know there is someone there's a, a rabbi here it's called zach Hammett, who's now trying to bring like jewish mysticism trying to utilize Jewish mysticism maps to navigate psychedelic implants. It's, it's like we have, there's more maps, there's more frameworks. And the idea is not trying to control, but at least having some kind of flickering lights that I can like use when it gets really, really overwhelmed. You know, like one thing that this is bringing up and I'm curious, I've heard it so many times with so many, um, is our plants loving or not? <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's so fascinating to me because I've heard it. I love that conversation because it's some people are like, I will never do ayahuasca. That plant is so intense. It's so aggressive. It's so violent. It's, it's too much. 
I want to do what Chuma. What Chuma is very loving, very caring. It's very nurturing. It's very, and I've heard it. I've heard everybody has their own, and it's you know part of this thing. I think for me about masculine and feminine is it really opens up this conversation of even our perception of love. Right? I had experiences personally where I was in not just psychedelic or plant, but in experiences of self-work, in experience of relationships with people I was doing work with. And I was like, this, this is not love. If love, if this was love, then it should have felt this way. And then a month, two months, six months, a year later, I was like, actually it was. Or there was a high, there was a bigger sense of, there was a bigger love that was at play. Right. And I remember I also having experiences where I was being extremely challenged sitting with the plants or being in Peru and being like dieting and being like, what the fuck is happening? Like, I'm falling apart. I'm this, in this liminal space. I don't know left from right. I'm having these intense visions and dreams in my waking state, right? And I'm suffering. Where, where is the love here? And then coming out and being like, oh, there is a whole other category of love. That was okay. Right? So even with that, how do we differentiate between like, is there a masculine love? Is there a feminine love? Is there, do the plants love in a different way? Do they connect, like expand our idea of what love is? Or do they even love? I don't know, do plants love? Is it, do they, do they function on that frequency at all? Or do they function on a whole different But even, I think it's important because in those stages of transformation, we can get very easily into the archetype of either I'm a victim, right? I'm the victim archetype. It's being done to me. And the moment we get there, everything inside of us for right, for right reasons, right? Because usually it's kind of an, some kind of in my mind, it's some kind of mirror of some past victimization, some past trauma we're still experiencing. Where I was suffering and nobody tended to me, either when I was a baby or a child or an adolescent, where I was in deep emotional suffering or even physical suffering, and nobody tended to me. I was listening to your podcast with Jenny, and who is a dear friend who I love dearly. And you were telling your story about having your, your nose broken. Um, you shared with her your story about having your nose broken in your work, right? And going to a hospital and being said like, yeah, come back in three days. <laughs> right? And I was sitting there and I was like, how would I react? That would really piss me off. Here I am in my suffering and you're telling me to come back in three days? As, as right, also as the archetype of the healer that I'm supposed to be taking care of, but that could have set a whole bunch of, of right of bells internally. And I would start doubting, right? For, like potentially I could see myself going into a place of the, the, the emotional disconnect of the medical system, how it's running on patriarchy and capitalism and all these shadow masculine traits that are the opposite of love. The opposite of the, the good father archetype or the good mother archetype where you come hurt and you're like, wait, wait, you're hurt, come here right away. Right, which Jenny was talking about, about how, right, she said something about in her experience, all of a sudden sitting with a doctor, a naturopathic doctor who like, was really curious. And I want to hear a thing about love, but I can say as a therapist, I find myself in this humoristic and actually really meaningful experience because when I tell people, random people, I always tell this story. I remember flying to Israel and sitting on a plane and uh, 
this woman, maybe she was mid thirties, sat next to me. And, you know, we're going to be on a plane together for 16 hours. So, hi, how are you? How my name is this, my name is that. And she asked me, she was, uh, what do you do? And I was like a therapist. And her first response, like, oh, are you going to analyze me? You know, very cynical, very sarcastic. <laughs> and I laughed and, you know, I know that response. What happened though is that she didn't stop talking for two hours. Something inside of her was, and I think this is all of us, something inside of us is craving to be seen. It's craving to be met. It's craving someone else reaching inside of us and touching us. And yet we want to defend against that at all costs. Because, you know, God forbid what happens if you do that and it doesn't feel good if you re-traumatize me, if you hurt me, or, you know, like healing modalities will do to you, what happens if you actually stir me up to see all the ways in which I'm wounded, to see all the ways in which I'm traumatized, or open me up to these dimensions of experience that are so beyond my ego's exec, again, liminality, beyond my ego, my sense of who I am, that I'm going to get confused and disoriented. So we stay in that sleep, half awake, half asleep state. So, Jason, what? How do they talk about plants and love in, in the Amazon? <laughs> well, I, I think it's fascinating because you brought up a, a lot of really interesting examples. I mean, the the two you brought up the like the, the sitting up thing. I think that's a great example when, when someone is in ceremony, uh, that's from my experience, that's what I've most often heard from the people working with these medicines is sit up. Um, you know, they, they would often even use the word dominard, which has a very, like, if you directly translate that, it has a very what could maybe be described as like a masculine quality to dominate. They'd say, you know, like you have to dominate the medicine, you have to subdue it. Um, I think probably a better translation is this of mastering, you know, you have to master the medicine, you have to master the effect, but that idea of sitting up is really important because it's not a, it's not a receptive position. It's an, it's an active position. It's like coming up and meeting the medicine and saying like, Hey, here I am, mm -hmm. which interestingly, because all of these things are interrelated, that active position of sitting up is also a receptive position. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. in a way saying like, I'm, I'm here to receive the medicine by being active. I'm, you know, this is where all of this duality comes in and the, the polarity and, um, like I heard it described really well, like if even little things in, in different traditions, like, like you were mentioning India, like it's often a very common, uh, I don't know what the word is, like a, not a tradition, but a, it would be impolite to, if someone is, is speaking to, to have your feet pointed towards them. And, mm -hmm. and like, obviously there can be this quality of like dirtiness, but but, but I think more so it's this thing of like respect, like I, I need to sit up, you know, I'm not like laying down and like my head, is, you know, my, my head is in my hand and I'm looking everywhere. No, like I'm, I'm deeply taking in what they're saying. Um, I'm, I'm concentrated. That, that's also a word you hear a lot in this work. It's like concentrate, concentrate, uh, come, come back to the center, you know, the, the mind is over here, it's over here, concentrate, come back to the center. There are also times where these medicines will throw us into a receptive place where there is just no sitting up. There is just a complete overwhelm in a way. Um, and, and that's something I've also experienced. And, you know, interestingly, in, in, in my most difficult experience where I really needed help, and it was the first time that that had ever happened, uh, you know, I think part is just who I am. Part is that that being in that position um, of helping rather than being helped. But it was very fascinating. Like the 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 thought was there. Like I need help, but I couldn't do anything. 
Yeah, like, like literally I couldn't call out. It was like beyond that, <laughs> but it took me a while to realize that I just needed to crawl to the center of the Maloka. And just, as you said, in, in a way, just being open, just saying like, here I am, like, I don't know what to do. And interestingly, uh, there was a man and a woman there and the only support that I really felt I could rely on was from the woman. And there was nothing really she could do. I mean, maybe there was, I don't know, but for me, it was really just this sense of receptivity of just being there, just witnessing what was happening. And even just being able to like, to know that there was this person there. Um, and it, like even in, in the gospel of Thomas, there, there's this beautiful line. I don't know if I'm quoting it exactly right, but he, he's, Jesus is speaking to his male disciples and he's saying, you need to become like Mary. The, the only way <laughs> you'll enter the mm. kingdom of heaven is to become a woman. And, and I think that's pointing towards that, that idea that you were talking about of this, this androgynous nature of, of, again, the joining of the polarities do plants experience, do they experience, do they give love? Are they a representation of that? Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of different ways of looking at that, but, and I think it really comes down to a fundamental question of, of how do we view the universe? Do, do we view it from a place of love or do we view it from a place of, of, of fear, mm -hmm. of, of mistrust? Uh, because also I think that idea of love is a complete trust. It's a complete faith. It's a complete letting go. It's a complete giving in, which again, does embody more of these archetypical uh, feminine qualities. Um, you, you know, it's, it's all of these things are, <laughs> they're, they're, they're very difficult to say, you, you know, you also use this example of, of like a father and a mother and again, there's a real, there's a realness behind that. I was listening to a conversation the other day, and it was this guy speaking about how when his father told him something, it had a much different resonance than when his mother told him something, because he, he knew there was, there was a different consequence behind that. And it's not to take away from, from a mother or a father, but there's a reality behind that. Like, if you look at almost all of the physical violence in the world, it's men against women or men against men. <laughs> the commonality in that is the man because there's, there's, a, there's an inherent physicality in the structure of a man that, and you know, we, we all can, can know that. Like if I'm sitting in Moloko with, with 50 people and, and a, a woman gets out of control, like that's not gonna have the same impact on me then if, you know, a guy gets out of control, there, there's, there's, there's physical consequences that, that not only maybe I have to deal with myself, but maybe I'm going to have to deal with to protect like other people. Like there's just a, there's a reality there. And so I, I think in that way, um, in this idea of love, you know, you were mentioning often ayahuasca can be described. It's, it's often described by people in this more feminine quality. It's often represented by the anaconda, which is, is very much a feminine symbol. It is the symbol of wisdom. Uh, so even the name, as you said, it, it has more of this symbol of wisdom. Um, and yet it is a, it's a combination of both, of both the masculine and the feminine. But, but I think people often describe that because in a way there is like a felt sense of the way the medicine is moving. Like, even as you describe this, like penetration, this, this thing that's flowing through my body, almost this serpent like quality, it's, there's a dance to it. There's this ethereal nature. There's this, 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 this it's done at night, you know, under the moonlight, like all of these feminine uh, qualities, there's, it, it's often not very direct, you know, it's often very, I don't know what's happening. Like, there's not this sense of like, oh yeah, I get this, this is this, and this is this, and this is this, <laughs> you know, we're all over the place often. And, and so I think it embodies that. And, and, and there's other plants that, that may embody more of that masculine quality, like tobacco often gets uh, described in that way, 
not that it doesn't have both, but that often the way it works would be more described in those archetypal masculine qualities. Like the teaching is very direct. It's very clear. Uh, we leave feeling very grounded, very rooted, uh, like a sense of power, a sense of strength. And so I think like any of these things, uh, I mean, like any doctor, like you don't just use any medicine for any person, like medicines are used for specific things. Is this person, are they, do they have a dysbiosis of this? So therefore I need this plant, this other person, it's on the other spectrum. So I need this plant. And then even us as humans, uh, I think one of the things in this work, which is really beautiful is, is acknowledging the individual, like what are that what are those individual strengths? Like maybe this person is really solid. They are really grounded. So can you cultivate that? Is That's now their medicine. And, and I think that's something that's really overlooked. And, and in all of these traditional si societies, like everyone had their role. And, and I think that's also, that, that's something Amika talks about, which again, for him is where a lot of our suffering comes from is we've forgotten our roles. Like, who, who am I? Like, what, what are my abilities? Like, am I the doctor? Am I the collector? Am I the peacekeeper? Am I the, the, the bringer together of the community? Am I the caretaker? And there's a real power in all of those. And, and none of those roles are seen as any better or worse than the other. They're all vital. They're all equal. Um, you know, in, in, in many of, from my experience, these, these indigenous cultures, they worked as a community because there wasn't inherently like a leader. There wasn't someone who said, no, you have to do this and you have to do this. It's well, if there's this problem, we go to this person. If there's this problem, we go to this person. Why? Because that's their role. That's their natural gift. And so I think a lot of that is cultivating those gifts. And again, those can be broken down into archetypal masculine feminine yeah. because they're, they're very, almost always there were very specific roles for the man, for the woman. Um, so I think part of that is cultivating those inherent gifts. And yet also, as you were speaking about this androgynous nature is any of those things can also begin to bring an imbalance because if we're too much in any of those ends of the spectrum, then it, we're, we're, we're missing or we're lacking or we haven't necessarily cultivated that other end of the spectrum. And, and so I think all of these things are, are about bringing things back into balance. I, I mean, that's, that's the archetypal quality of what it means to be a, a, a healer, a doctor, is a doctor is treating dis-ease. They're trying to bring the organism back into ease. And it was also interesting because you mentioned uh, Jacques from, from Takiwasi. He also wrote a really beautiful article about tobacco and mm -hmm. how he was saying, you know, <laughs> Because I think a lot of us, we realize that, that potentially society for a long time has maybe gone in more of this archetypal masculine quality, um, the rationality, the, the, the trying to know, the, the, the reduction, the, the, the labeling, uh, the, the power, the, the, the force. But he was actually saying, and this is something I've also experienced, is that anytime there's a pushback against that, we can begin to go out of balance in the other direction. And he was saying a lot of the things he's now seeing is an imbalance of, of an excess of feminine qualities, uh, like of not, you know, even like in that medicine space, like, I think that's a really good example. Like, it would be really easy to say like, oh, well, you can do it at whatever. You can go outside the maloka, or you can lay down or you can hang from the mm. rafters or this is more of that like flowing, like fluid, whatever, whatever goes. And yet we know there is that that's important, but also that structure is vitally important. Like if someone is hanging from the rafters, that's not good. <laughs> 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 they're, they're probably going to hurt themselves. <laughs> and, and, you know, he was saying like one of the things he really finds beautiful about tobacco is like bringing that order. And it, it's also something I, I've seen a lot in my experience. I think some of these plants that maybe do embody yeah. these more feminine qualities, it's because there really is a deep need for that. Like the, I, I think there's no reason or the, it's not a, a coincidence that plants like ayahuasca are proliferating at such a, 
at, at such a tremendous pace because there's a deep need for that. There's a deep longing of that connection, that 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 sense of being part of a whole, of of going into the darkness, of, of going into our traumas, of of, of uh, you know all of these things are vital. And yet, if taken in too much of a direction, and <laughs> without being too mean, being here in the Sacred Valley, I think a lot of people can see people who are maybe they have an excess of that. There, there's so much in in this upper realm that they've forgotten how to root that back down, and and that's vital. Uh, like like all of the the really good healers that I know, they're very rooted people. They're very grounded people. Like they have an access to those realms. They can go there if they need to, but they're not walking around all day, you know, like, like staring at the stars and like, you know, oh, I have an appointment. Oh, from I the raptor. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> And and so yeah, I think that's where that androgynous quality is super important. It's bringing that uh, balance and 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 that 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 question of love. I don't know. That, that's something I think everyone would have to would have to answer themselves. But but I I do think anyone, as you were saying, who, who's really gone into to to this work, has a sense that that is what these plants are pointing towards. Now that doesn't mean we're going to get love in the way we think, you know, sometimes we need that very strong, strict, like slap in the face, like, like, look, this is not just games. This isn't just something that we're doing for fun. Like this is, this is serious in a way. And that's where that balance is. If it becomes too serious, then there's no light, then there's no joy, then there's no fun. Then why would I, why would I do it? But if it's too much in that direction, then we can very easily get lost in that and like not realize like, you know, we may have 10 beautiful ceremonies and that's amazing. But if, if it was infinite, beautiful ceremonies, it, it would lose meaning. And so sometimes we need a ceremony that comes and is like, oh my God, this is terrifying. This is horrible whatever words we want to use, but also from those experiences, as you said, in retrospect, there's a tremendous growth from that. There's a tremendous learning of, of things like humility, of gratitude, of awe, of, of understanding that, that I don't know, you know, like often we need that <laughs> again, going back to archetype terms, we need that masculine like slap to get out of that more masculine way of looking at things of like, I know everything. I'm the greatest. I'm the best. <laughs> I can do anything. And by, by having that, that experience, there's a tremendous emerging of more in that feminine of the grace of the receptivity of the humanity. That's the word. That's the word. You know, it's interesting. You said that it's, there's so much that I resonate with and I, I always appreciate how nuanced you can get. I mean, for me, it's interesting you said it, that masculine slap because I usually see it in people I work with and in myself. It's like actually like a feminine slap. But it's, it's always in the aftermath it gets revealed as grace and, and an act of love. And then you said so many, there's like so many points I want to come back to. It's, I think you named maybe the hardest, you know, as we think about First of all, doing when, when we say this practice, for me, it's like being full human. It's being a body human. It's, it's, it's not just relegated to plants and psychedelics. It's being a body human that's walking around in this planet. It's really choosing to participate consciously in what it means to be a human, a full human being. So it, you, you can get to it through everything through every medium, through every practice. Um, yeah, you know, you said something about, oh, the, the biggest, I think you named the biggest integration, human integration challenge, which is how do I bring heaven and earth together, right? I don't want to use that cliche Kabbalistic term of like as above, so below, right? But how do we pull, how am I 
I mean, that's where Jung and I think all Eastern tradition, I know the Judeo-Christian mysticism, mystic tradition, it's how do you bring back opposites and create that alchemy over and over and over and over. And you are the vessel. Your psyche is the vessel. Your heart is the vessel. Your body is the vessel. Not something outside of you. You are the one that's going to do that work. Obviously, with connection to the planet, to the world, to the planet, to everything. But you are that vessel. And I think that is the hardest, the most challenging thing for all of us. I see people who have profound insights in therapy or seeing a movie or uh, people I work with who come back from ceremonies or come back from dietas and they touch they literally, they touch profound insights about their own traumas or profound, like they touch divinity and the lack of a better term. And they come back here and everything falls apart. Right? It's the famous, like, Joseph Campbell returned the llama. It's like, I don't know what to do. I, I've touched it. I've seen it. And now I'm sitting here in fucking Berkeley and there's homeless people on the street and trains and this and that and how this doesn't make sense so right what usually happens our mechanism is i either flee let me go and like right let me cling to the spiritual i'm going to be like a hot air balloon and just float over there or we collapse like crash into into earth and then it's like okay how do i make myself not feel uncomfortable not be in the liminal space because that is the liminal space. Return is always a liminal space. How does the old fit with the new? Does the old should fit the new? Maybe the old is just done. Maybe that's it. Right? So I think you named that really profound. And that's why I keep, like, I brought that idea of, okay, so we need to think about the space. What is the space that I need to create? And... You brought up something actually, which feels like a synchronicity for me. I was talking to someone who's very dear to me, who um, had a very profound experience in Peru just three months ago, um, which really put them in a very speak about liminality, like questioning everything, everything about their existence, pretty much. And they are visiting their family which is the whole, it's, it's a whole other ritual. If, you, if you're going to do this work and then you go visit your family, like really, I give you all the respect. Um, and they were describing these profound insights about seeing the role. And they're like, I've been a bridge all my life for myself, trying to get them to see uh, how their narrow view of, culture of religion is so confining and they were describing this insight of like i'm realizing that being clinging to that role is disconnecting me from myself so i loved what you said about we need to recognize our role like there is beauty in recognize we all carry these beautiful energies of what we can contribute to this planet to humanity but also, how do we not cling in it? Because then you're just like, you're becoming a psychological role. You're not being yourself. Right? Then I'm, a, I'm just a therapist. I'm not ego. I'm not the soul that is here and can have a lot more. And you said, and that you tied it to something that we've been talking for so long about, which is how do we do that when we live in a culture that has a very, very well articulated, specific role prizing. If you're this, you get this. You get this amount of money, this amount of fame, this amount of fortune, this amount of respect. And, you know, because we live in mostly a very distorted community, like culture, you get this amount of love. Right? So you want, so you want, do you want to get this amount? Okay, so you have to become this thing. And that creates this intense, intense um, split between who we are, like you said, who we actually are. Can you remember who you are? Can you remember why you came from? Like why you came here and who you truly are to who I think I should be to get all those unmet needs, to get all those unmet 
moments of love and kindness and, and compassion. And that made me think about what you said about men and violence. I mean, yes, men are biologically, for some reason, why you're right, we can speak about that to have more violence in them. And how much of that is also a byproduct of men being violently dissociated and disconnected from their feminine? You know, I'm thinking about your beautiful experience of needing help and realizing, okay, I have to crawl. Like, right, that's a, for me, that's like, most other men would sit there and try to figure out their way of yelling. How do I yell that I need help? Right? As opposed to get humbled. I mean, I've had a similar experience to you. It's funny. I've had an experience of being, it's actually the, I think the one time I drank tobacco with, um, <laughs> with ayahuasca. Um, and I was in a very open space. I was moving in and out between knowing which planet I was in to like figuring out like that there's a, I have to remind myself I have a floor underneath me. And, and I got to a place where I was like, I need help. I, I cannot and I couldn't. My wiring was, oh no, you don't, we don't ask for help. Like, that's not what you do. Like, you figure it out on your own. And I was not in that space. And I was sitting inside that conversation. And all of a sudden, I heard this beautiful feminine voice saying, in a few minutes, you are going to crawl to the middle of the room and ask for help. And and it, and it just faded. And lo and behold, you know, who knows how many minutes it was, but I'm sure it was a few minutes. I'm finding myself crawling, not voluntarily, but crawling to the middle of the room, being like, I really need help. And all of a sudden having this, actually, it's funny, he was a man, but a man that's very connected to his feminine. It's like, oh, of course. And he helped me up and took me out and we were standing outside and like, right. And I guess what I'm, is that we have to also think about that as far as, again, there's the feminine masculine archetype conversation about men know that's what they know. That's the masculine trauma is violence. It's aggression. It's hiding. And I agree with, I think there is, yes. And so for a lot of men, and, you know, on a personal note, it's one of my passions. It's, I think for a lot of men who do this work, who do plants, I, men are missing from the plants world, from like the after plant world. They show up in ceremonies, they show up in stuff like this. But when I do integration circles with Diana, we get, we rarely get men. It's one or, you know, if we're lucky, it's two or three token men. Usually it's one or none. And I, we keep thinking about it. It's like, wow, interesting. Here we are creating this container that's supposed to hold people's vulnerability and intimacy and desire to connection. And where are the men? And how much of that is a reflection of something much, much deeper as far as that wound of that archetype? Of like men stepping into the feminine, stepping into that container of liminality we're talking about, and showing up and saying like, yeah, I'm struggling. Yeah, I'm having a hard time. Being seen by women, which is a whole other conversation, in that vulnerability. And, and it's, for me, it's really, you know, it's, there's something, obviously my, my psychological self is fascinated, but my, my man self, my masculine self is really sad because I'm like, that's what we need. That's exactly, again, that tension about, can you let yourself um, be, be penetrated, be entered into? And more than that, can you, you know, more than that, can you let yourself can you choose to want to be in intimacy? Because that's what we need more. I really think that one of the problems we have in this world right now is that we lack intimacy. 
we think we have intimacy, but true intimacy you have. True intimacy with the planet, true intimacy with the earth, true intimacy with the invisible world, where you know, like, I love that story that you bought, where your family doesn't tell you, oh, it's just a dream, where people are like, oh, wait, 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 you dreamt it, you're dying. We take it seriously. We get curious about it. We sit with it because your inner world is talking. That's intimacy. And then let alone, obviously, you know, between us and the spiritual world, which is a whole other conversation, and between us, between people. I mean, let's look at what happened in the last year and a half. You know, for better and for worse, yes, there is also limits of intimacy. We all need boundaries in our own space and that. But I'm in California. At the height of COVID, 40% of San Francisco moved. And where did people move? They moved to be closer to their family. They moved to be closer to places where they have a community. Why? Because they realized that what they have here, I've heard it so many times. They're like, what I have here is not really real. And I want real intimacy. I want a village. I don't want a town anymore. You know, and I think that is tightly connected to this very obviously very big topic we're trying to like here, which is masculine. You know, and I, I'm curious, I'm going to look at that. Uh, my beat article, but I'm sure that there is something for the feminine too, right? And most women that I work with, even women who come back, you know, um, from who do this kind of deep psycho spiritual work, the wound of the feminine is to retrieve that strength. So here's reclaiming some of that masculine, finding your voice, finding. I have a dear friend of mine, Krista, who works with women, and her idea is to really empower women, finding that inner. Uh, medicine woman, that inner witch, not witch in the negative sense, but that really like that archetype that bridges the psycho and the spiritual, the body and the spirit. Because of so many, you know, we can trace it to like witch hunt in Europe and you know how women have been like all medicine women have been treated for most part around the world, but it's such a deep disconnect. And she just shared me, she's like, you know, the more I do this, all the women that I work with describe the same, what we would call like archetypal motif. Like they're all, all of a sudden landing in the space of like, I can see the disconnect in my body. And when they start healing it, they start having these profound dreams, visions, experiences of the divine feminine. All of a sudden, these incredible feminine figures start showing up in their dreams, start showing up in their visions. They start tapping into incredible amounts of power, let alone like psychic abilities and intuitive abilities. And, you know, to use, and they're symbolically, it feels like they're able to sit up straight even better all of a sudden. They don't have to hide. They don't have to have this. So it's funny. It's interesting, like how it feels like men have to move from this to like being more like in what you're saying, that fluid, dancey, limber kind of spine while the feminine is moving from that to like i can also take this position and be receptive from here and can you meet me here and something we said before the recording and i totally agree with you is we need i think it is i love that you and merava are doing it together because it is you see, as le as facilitators to see you're already embodying that, right? So I work with Diana a lot, and it's beautiful. We talk a lot about that. How sometimes she will take on the masculine, and I become like softer and just like containing, and then we move. And there's something about people, I think, even not consciously experiencing us is that that it brings it to the space. You're feeling like you're held by both of by two edges of that spectrum. And it plays right into the space. You know, I used to tell my teacher at the time, like, I had this fantasy. I was like, I want to see you do a uh, all men retreat by, led by a woman. <laughs> right. So I don't know why you're laughing, but for me, it's like, yeah, because I know what it's going to do. I know it's going to go straight to the core. 
meaning it's going to bring all of men's, you know, usual stuff that, like, everybody's going to try and seduce her and, pretty, like, put on a show, and then eventually that will crack down, and then there will be, right, all the desire to be mothered, and that will crack down, and then it's like, okay, now we can start that conversation. Can you let yourself be entered by a woman who's so powerful, who sees you? Right, so back to that idea of, like, can you be in intimacy that is that? without us trying to sexualize it, eroticize it, own it. Right? That's a big thing. That we, like when we feel connected to someone, um, and I see this a lot, you probably do. I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to project that you, you do too, but I see this a lot in retreats and people who come back from retreats. Is you get so open and you start feeling that interconnectedness that we have with people. And because we're so wired to feel like, oh, well, if I'm connected to you like that, then obviously there's something. Like it's either sexualized or like I need, there's an ownership factor as opposed to like, no, welcome to the realm where we are just really fucking connected. And, you know, in this beautiful, intimate, erotic way that is soulful. And it's not about ownership. Not about us making something of it. Again, staying in the liminal space. We don't need to concretize it. Can we just be in a space where you and I are so connected? We can have a conversation like this. And that's what it is right now. That's it. So again, that practice of staying in... in that mix of masculine, feminine, and all the other forces and being in the liminal. Can we just be present? I mean, I, I really love what you brought from tobacco, and I'm very, very curious to do more research about it because I've heard it from, that's why I got, I asked you about your work before because the word presence kept coming back when I talked to people about it. And there is something intuitive that feels that, for me at least, that tobacco can give, which is this very grounded, presence and what a beautiful powerful tool that is I mean what do we need I mean if you're going to go and do all this work if you're not present if, you, if there's no home to come back to where do you go where is all this going to land I, I was speaking to to, to one of the um, the, the people dieting with us uh, yesterday and she was saying she was feeling very strange because she was in this luminal space uh, in this like uh, oscillating space between the sense of like a deep presence and this sense of like infinite possibility and it was interesting because she was saying like that actually also felt a bit ungrounded uh, because it, it was, it was almost this, this new feeling of, I can be completely happy right here. Like the world is beautiful. And yet also this sense of like, there's all of this other, there's all of these other potentialities that can be worked towards. And, um, I mean, basically everything we're talking about is, is polarity and, and it's so fascinating. And one of the things you also mentioned earlier, which, which I also really agree is that in a sense, like all of this work is self work, uh, you know, and it's been said in, in different ways, different, different, there's many different ways of saying that, but uh you know, like just an example, like it was attributed to Lao Tzu, who knows if he actually ever said it or if he was even a person, but this idea that if we want to change the darkness in the world, we, we have to change the darkness in ourselves. Like we have to go in and, and, and bring harmony inside. And then the external world becomes a reflection of that internal harmony like that as above, so below. Um, you also mentioned this really interesting thing, like with, with, with COVID, uh, Hopefully, saying that word doesn't get this uh, <laughs> this episode censored. But um, 
but that in, in, I mean, that's fascinating that in San Francisco, 40% of the population moved out. I mean, that's, that's incredible, but, um, but this sense of like coming home and this sense of also like what, what is important, uh, and that's where even I think in a way, you know, all of these terms have their limits, but like this archetype of East and West and East being like much more family oriented and, and community and, and our actions aren't just for us. They're, they're also for, for others. And in the West, this idea of, of like individualism and, you know, it's, it's for me to forge ahead and, uh, uh, even in the U S I mean, it's such a massive country. It's, it's, I mean, part of it is just, well, the job I want to go to is in San Francisco and my family's in New York. Well, all of a sudden now I'm <laughs> a six hour plane ride exactly. away or a three day drive. <laughs> um, but I guess the question is, where do you, where do you see that balance? Because obviously, again, like anything, neither of those is inherently better. Neither, both of those have disadvantages. I mean, it, it was one thing uh, when I was living in Thailand, I, I really saw that, like, I saw a lot of sadness in people because it was like, they wanted to, to pursue their dream, but they kind of couldn't because their obligation was to their family. Maybe, maybe it was a, a hierarchy of, of where they were born. You know, the, 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 the youngest, their, their duty was to look after the family. And so then that was their role in a way that was their life. And, and so often there was this sadness on the other hand, there was often this beauty of, of just like maybe what I want to do isn't important as the, the good of, of my family and my community. And, um, you know, I, I remember like even, even in Brazil, I remember it was really interesting talking to people and it was the, it was one of the few countries I had been to where, because I was there as a, as a tourist, as a traveler. And sometimes I, I would talk to people or people would talk to me and, uh, I remember talking to another buddy of mine who was an American living there and he said, and it was really true and it resonated. He was like, this is the only country I've been to where people kind of don't want to leave. <laughs> like they just, huh. they, they, they have it pretty good. Like they're, they're happy with where they're at. And, and I think there was a real truth to that. Um, of course, not everyone. I mean, you know, some Brazilians travel, but um but so again, kind of like that duality. And, and so what is your experience with, with that, 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 that individualism, which is, is so important and, and has been said so many times, even in, in this work of plant work or any spiritual path, in a sense, like that's where it has to start from. And yet, as I think so many traditions, you, you know, like, it's funny because even in the U S like that word has a bit of a negative connotation. Like if you say someone has like traditional values <laughs> mm -hmm. that has a negative connotation. And yet those often the same people would have a negative connotation to that. If you said like indigenous values, then they'd be like, Oh, well, those are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. you know, like this, this and sense that's the cultural like, wound for you, <laughs> right? you know, this sense of like, getting married, having children, settling down, like building a life, uh, having land that you're connected to, having community, having a church that you go to, like there actually is a vital importance to that, which I think you were saying like with, with COVID, what that brought out was people like a lot of people were 40% of people were like, uh, like, what am I doing? Like, maybe this isn't the, the whole point of life. Maybe there are other things that are equally as important, and, and so that balance, you know, because both of those are, I'm so, much so happy you brought this up. I'm so happy, really. You have no idea. Because <laughs> I've, I've been really, I think, yeah, like I said, I think being in a liminal space, I actually, what I've been reflecting deeply on for personal and professional reasons is exactly that question of, uh, if you choose to live an integrated life, which means that you are connected to your psychological and spiritual self. For me, and when I say psychological, I don't mean, I have to make it clear. Psychological for me is the land of the body, the heart and the psyche, and then the spiritual I'm having on top of it. So it's not living here, it's not that. 
Um, I think part of what came up for me in the last couple of weeks is when you evolve, evolution has, it doesn't live in the body, right? You think you're one thing, you go and have an experience, you realize you're this. It moves you out of structures. So I think if there, the question for me, Jason, is can you let, what if you're, evol what if you're a person who's like, I'm not going to have kids, I don't want tradition, and all of a sudden you have this experience, and out of your personal evolution, you realize, like, I actually do want kids. I actually do want to settle down. I thought I'm going to be this thing who's going to hop around the universe, like the world and do this and that and be a career person. And actually I do want a family. I do want to have children. I think that creates a lot of tension for people because they can't, it's so different than what the structure of self you created and you thought you were that for most of us, first of all, it goes into like a feeling of defeat. Like, oh, what? I'm going to become one of those people? Here's that cultural wound again. I'm going to become one of those? It probably means something is off. Like I'm weak or I'm just like something. There's going to be a negative connotation as opposed to, for me, it's like, if you're really opening to the feminine, which means expand like that person you, you shared, she could see in infinite possibilities. If I'm really opening myself up, can you let yourself, can you let that process experience you? Which is different than yourself experiencing the process. Can you let that process tell you who you're becoming? I moved here from Israel. I didn't have a choice. It was clear to me that I moved. And it's funny, everybody around me when I moved was like, I would never be able to do that. The idea is terrifying to me. Like, all I got was feedback of, like, people were impressed, and but what they vocalized for me was their fear, for the most part. And if I listened to that, I would probably stay. I would probably start thinking about the future, and what it means to be abroad for so long and the, the distance from family and this and that. And I'd be like, oh shit, I don't want to do this. This is too much. Right? So it, I think it's really, that's for me, that is transformation. When we talk about coming back, like integration, it's exactly that. How do we build the bridge between this profound experiences that are so ego challenging that you are actually able to follow. One of my teachers, Susanna Bustos, talks about there is integration, inner experience, and then there's implementation. Like if you all of a sudden realize, right, if you saw yourself as like an eternal bachelor and all of a sudden you're like, I want to settle down. I want to, I want to be a father. You're going to be terrified, probably, walking that path to a certain degree. Some people are like, they're able to do the work and integrate, and they're like, yes, I'm all in. But it's like, okay, can you walk, can you allow yourself to trust that that is what's true and start implementing it? Meaning now I'm going to look for a partner who wants that thing to with me. And I'm going to have to work out all those moments where that old sense of self is going to come and be like, you sure you want to do that? You know, look at all these other options. Look at all these other sparkly things. Right? In the Jungian language, they're talking about there's two archetypes. There is the puer and the puella. These are the eternal children. Now, they're not the child just like the psychological child. They're both the psychological, but also the divine child. They're, they're the source of what gives us awe and playfulness and uh, this sense of uh, infinite possibilities and wonder. You see the world through the eyes of wonder. You can see beyond the veil. But their shadow is they don't want to land. They don't want to be like firm, embodied. That feels like that. So you see people, you know, who are just like, 
and it's not with judgment, but it's, it's, I see it and I see it in myself. We're like, just want to stay, like you said, on the rafters. <laughs> How do I stay above the ground? So I don't feel the pain of being embodied. So I don't feel the pain of the planet. So I don't feel the, the, the pain of daily stress. I mean, you wake up, you do your job, right? If anything means you're doing it in, in the sacred valley, you still have responsibilities, you record this podcast. I wake up, I put on my therapist self and I go to work and I do this and take my dog out. And we have all these things, all these ways, right? We have relationships to show up in and we want to be mindful of the, the planet and worry and care about that. And so I think for me, it's really, it's when I thinking about it or feeling it right now, it's two things. It's, can you allow yourself to sit with that tension of who I thought I am and what I'm becoming, what is being shown to me, no matter how weird, different, and bizarre that is? Can I sit with it? You don't have to act, but can I sit and let the alchemy happen? And the other thing is grief. It's like, yeah, when I become something, it means that a lot of things die. If I want to have a partner and have a family, I don't get to be a hummingbird and go taste, unless you want to do polyamory and open relationships, which you can. But I don't get to go and, and experience what that gave me before. I don't get to just go and hide with my feelings and my thoughts and have free space whenever I want to. I have to change. So there is grief. And I, I want to emphasize that it's not, you know, this is where, as, you know, we can probably talk as Western people, we have issues because we don't have grief rituals. We don't have containers for grief. I always make this point that as a Jew, as an Israeli Jew, I was taught to mourn. I wasn't taught to grieve. We have a lot of rituals and it's beautiful, but we have a problem with letting go. <laughs> it's constant reminders. It's like, what happened? Right? It's like, okay, but can we... We will not forget, but can we also open up to the change? Right? So here it is again, open up to the change. So the idea is that it's not grief of like, oh my God, my life is ruined and it's this and that. It's about grief as, once it was described to me, it's like grief is a fertilizer. Because if I let something go, if I grieve something that's lost, there's no opening for something else to come. If I grieve my, yeah, when you become a parent, if you grieve the fact that you're not going to be free whenever you want, that you have this being that you're taking care of, which means that your day doesn't end when you finish working. You have three hours afterwards where you have to become, become a parent. If you grieve that, really grieve it, I think it opens up the space to be present. Here it is again and find playfulness with my child. Find these small moments of joy and, and, and these moments of like nonverbal, wow, here it is, what I wanted to become. I wanted to become. So it doesn't mean that we're not gonna have those hard moments of like, oh God, like, this is hard. And can I just, you know, <laughs> I wish, I just want some time for myself. <laughs> I need a vacation. It's not about that. But it's this continuous alchemy. It's continuous integration. And I think that that's where change is really, really hard. And that's why, you know, like, I'm actually curious I don't know if we have time to hear your take because what you do is that you facilitate people entering into a world of profound openness and profound revelation through these dietas. And then they have to go and figure it out. They have to go and so they get to experience this new image of self and new image of world. And then they have to go and, and confront that with themselves. It's like, what? I thought I was this. And now I came to you and I'm seeing that I can, I'm that. And the world is that. And the plants are this. So I'm curious, Jason, what do you, how do you guys, what do you give people to take with them <laughs> to help them kind of do that first step in, in this really, it's a negotiation, it's an intense inner negotiation. 
you know, in Jungian language, they talk about it. That's the, the inner marriage. It's this continuous inner marriage. I mean, uh, it, I think you 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 put it beautifully. I don't think I have much to add to that. I, and I was speaking to someone about this. Maybe it was it was Jenny. I can't remember. Um, I'm, I'm doing so many of these now; they they tend to <laughs> overlap. But but it was about this idea of the heart, and that in in so many cultures, that's where they said the soul resided. And I remember because I've always been fascinated by uh, ancient Egypt and and just the the pyramids and and the rites and the rituals and the mythology and what was being pointed towards. And there's this beautiful, again, archetype of, of when we, when we, you know, enter the pearly gates there, there's a scale waiting for us and, and our, our heart has to be weighed on this scale and uh, against a feather. And, and I think it's this idea of, much like you were pointing towards with this plant work is so much of this plant work is, is pulling away these things. It's taking away the conditioning, this remembering, getting back to our essence beyond the name, the form, the, the, the layers that, that I put on, that society has put on that, that all of these things. And that, and that as we begin to do that, our heart begins to be freed. It, that, that's, that's the, the archetypal symbol of Jesus is that the heart is just beaming, you know, with fire and light, it's free. It's, it's, there's, there's love, there's love emanating out of that because there's nothing in the way of that inherent love. And it, <laughs> it's certainly not to say that, that taking ayahuasca or tobacco is going to, <laughs> to turn us into Jesus, but but I think it's a process. And, and like you said, like anything that there's, there's infinite processes that, that, that we can do to do that. Uh, you know, I, I, I had a ex-girlfriend once who I was telling her about like my travels around the world and, you know, I was all excited and, and she's like, Oh yeah, that, that sounds pretty amazing. And she's like, I think I can learn all of that from my garden in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought about it and I thought, well, you're probably right. <laughs> you know, all, all the teachings of the universe yeah. are, are embodied in, in that, e that little ecosystem in your backyard. And, um, but, you know, certainly, certainly these plants have, have a, have a, a very powerful ability to, to bring us into that. So, I think, as you said, it's about listening, really listening to our heart. And, you know, even that there's a lot of talk about like our, not, not only our brains, because I think that's what we used to think, like all neurology was in our brains. Now I think we're moving even more deeply into this sense of like our, our gut microbiome and how many sensors mm. and neural pathways there are. And I, I would imagine, you know, who knows, but at some point we, in this more scientific way of, of seeing things may see that, that actually there's even a deeper resonance that resides in our heart and, and to really feel that. And, you know, e even as you were going back a little bit to this, this, this dichotomy of, of, of masculine and feminine, I think there's probably a reason why so many men actually have heart attacks is, is because there, there are these very deep blocks, these, this, this deep pain, this deep anguish. And, and to be able to listen to that for anyone, it, it requires, it requires a sense of faith, a sense of trust, a, uh, going into the fear, you know, as you said, the fear of grief, of letting all of these things go, all of these things that that I th I thought who I was, and 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 I may have been that was a stage in my life of, but but as long as we hold on to those things, then then we 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 cut that connection with our heart, and and it, just working with plants, it may bring us in touch with that more as you said, but it's not going to, as you very beautifully said, it's not going to implement it. <laughs> there's, there's still a volition, which we have to, to take that, that path. And, 
And there's always, as I think uh, another really beautiful indigenous way of putting is th things is there's a cost for everything. You know, nothing mm -hmm. is free. Everything has a cost. Uh, but as, as we all begin to grow and to change, which is the natural evolution of, of every individual, of, of every society, of the earth itself, of the universe, can we flow with that change? And can be, are we willing to leave behind what no longer serves us? And, um, and, and yeah, that's a constant process. Like, what is my heart really telling me? And, and my mind may be telling me all sorts of, you know, no, no, don't do that. No, no. <laughs> Scary, problematic, da, da, da. <laughs> but there's something deeper inside that's saying like, Hey, this, this is, this is where we need to go now. And that's all, that's always scary because as you also said, that's, that's, that's probably the main archetype of plant work is going into the unknown. And that's terrifying for people. That's absolutely terrifying. And that's, that's also, even as you mentioned, like with your story of Israel, like that's what holds so many people back as well is there's all of these voices, whether they're real or internal voices saying all of the, the reasons why I can't do this or why I shouldn't do this. And yet there's, there's a deeper calling inside of us saying like, go forward, go forward, go into it. Um, so, yeah. There is this, just an anecdote. I remember uh, Passover, I took this course with this Kabbalistic rabbi and he talked about the Exodus. And he shared something that I didn't know. I mean, we can't prove it, but he was making this analogy to what you're saying right now. He's like, you know that 80% of the Jews who were in Egypt chose to stay. They chose to stay slaves and not be free because the idea of going on the journey of leaving was too terrifying. And he was making the same analogy you just made of, like, I think the point you were making, which is, yeah, that's our psychological dilemma. It's so scary to leave. And, you know, when you put it in the category of like, you stay in slaves and you stay in, in, and you don't, you're not really free. It's, it makes it a lot more dramatic. And it makes it, I think, a necessary dramatic because it's true. And obviously, it's really, really hard because no one, yeah, like we said, we don't have the village. No one teaches us that we should follow our soul. We should follow the hearts. We should follow intuition. We should follow, you know, the voices we hear, the dreams we have. We are taught to follow rational. Um, and yeah, the funny thing with love and the heart is that if someone, if you feel really loved, they will break that apart for you. <laughs> you know, they want you to be free. Love is about liberation. If you're anyone who's been in a healthy relationship, knows that you have to change. People say, oh, you, you know, I am who I am. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> then, then you won't be in a happy relationship. You'll just be in a, a very fixed form of relationship. You're not going to be in a very open, fluid, transformative, evolving relationship. And, and that's such mm -hmm. a powerful metaphor. I, I think it's actually a word that that is is underused in a way. And because there's 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 the horrific external slavery, which you know people from all over the world have experienced, but as someone who uh, I, I think many people have pointed towards it but I, I the the person that comes to mind is byron katie and you know she often talks mm. about her work with prisoners and in a sense they are a, you know they're they're a slave they're they're not free in the sense that they can't leave that cell they can't leave that building uh there there are people who manage every aspect of their lives but what she's trying to help them with is liberation and, and I think for so many people, that's, that's like a really difficult concept to grasp. Like, well, if, if you're a slave, if you're enslaved, how can you be free? And, but the point being that, that it, it's not, while the external is obviously there's a horrific quality to it, that we all have that ability to be 
our own slave masters. You know, all of these thoughts, mm. all of these barriers, all of these mm -hmm. beliefs, mm -hmm. they, they in a way enslave us. And, and in that way, that's what seems to be all of these traditions are pointing towards, as you said, is liberation, freedom. It is liberation. No, I, I think in, in the, in... sorry, I didn't mean to cut you, but I think that's the thing. And I would even forego as far as saying that when you are obviously we can talk about privilege and access and means and all that because it's important and real but when we don't do that work that we've been talking about right the connection between our inner world and our external world and how it lives inside of us we are enslaved to our traumas we are enslaved to the societal structures that are oppressing us. And we are being oppressed all the time. Gender, sexuality, I don't even get me started on capitalism. You go, I mean, you are been, I was, you were in New York now, I was in New York. You go down in New York, you are bombarded constantly with things you need to buy, with shows you need to watch, with that TV show and that theater thing, and this, you're constantly bombarded. Let alone, you know, when you walk in, you walk in certain neighborhoods. I mean, I found that interesting because it's in New York. It's so easy to see. If you go in any of the upper, like upper sides, you're bombarded by the beauty of the apartments and the, the, the you know, the clothes people wear and like what's kind of uh, who is their designer and who is this and the cars. And then you, if you go down, then you're bombarded by oh, this is really hip and I should go to this restaurant. You're constantly being, for me, it's a form of oppression. It's a form of like, you're constantly being told what you should be, where you should be, how you should be. And if I'm not connected to myself and I'm able to come back to me over and over again, that's where we get proud. So you're not really free. You are enslaved. Because the whole point is like, yeah, the importance of doing this, this kind of work, and especially for those who are, that's where the challenge begins, which is how do I come back? Now that I've tasted freedom, you know, and I've seen, like, yeah, I love that experience of that person you brought from your idea that like, now that I've tasted freedom and presence, how do I practice it here? How do I bring my, my you know, it's like the, the meditative things, like how do I bring the cave to the city? And that's where, yeah, and that's, I'm sure we can talk about that for a long, but that's where the integration piece is so important. And that's why I love what you're doing, even this podcast and the way you're talking about this, because that's where, that's where the work is. The work is not just about how I sit in ceremony. The work is not just about, for me at least, how deep I can talk with the plants. It's the work for me. It's like, can you talk to the plants when you're sitting inside of a very noisy street? Can you talk to yourself when you're sitting in front of inside of an oil street, can you put boundaries with your family? Because now this is what you need. Can you allow yourself, like we said, you know, we have to, or I brought up, can you allow yourself to love freely because you experienced it? You experienced your version of love as opposed to like the cultural version of love or your family of or like origin version of love. Can you allow yourself to do that when your ego is screaming or your defense, your protection system is screaming, don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to get hurt. It's too much. You're going to be a sucker. You're going to be this. You're not going to get back, whatever that is. Right? That's for me the embodiment practice now is how do we bring all these things back? You know, when we're surrounded by something that can be so opposite. And it's so tempting, right? For me, at least, that I can't tell you how many times I've had this conversation with friends of mine last year about um, let's just move to uh, let's just move to Costa Rica. Let's just start our own island and like, do this thing. It's like it's so tempting, and you know, I'm still tempted at some point. Uh, but there is also something that feels, you know, I was talking with this friend about. Um, not to go off topic, but Jeff Bezos and uh, what's his name from Virgin flying to space. 
And I was like, Richard yes, Benson. it's great. But yeah, Richard Benson. Um, and Elon Musk is building his own spaceship, right? And we were talking about how it's great and evolution. And, you know, it's like, and I'm like, it also feels like such a representation of the, the predicament of like human attachment. Like, oh, it's broken? Bye. All those billions of dollars, if they were invested in like trying to solve the ecological crisis, what would have happened? If they were invested in like feeding people, how much change would it be? So it's just this interesting way in which all these archetypes we're talking about are living around us, right? Do I escape intimacy with the planet when the planet is suffering and humanity is suffering? Do I go and find a new thing, right? My relationship is not working, fuck it, I'm out. Let me go find a new partner. Or do I bring all this knowledge, all these experiences that I'm having? Do I challenge my view of self? I mean, for me, that's like, that's spiritual transcendence. I challenge my view of self and I show up differently. And that, how do we, how do we facilitate that process? Yeah, so much. What do you think is the in your work as um, in the field of, of, of psychology of, of of working with plant integration? What do you what do you see as the the biggest challenge that people have? Where and and obviously, I guess it's somewhat biased because if they're coming to you, that there's probably that's already one one step in in a direction that they're taking, but. But um, from what you see, what is the what do you think is the main challenge that people are are really dealing with? And I think it's a it lot of what we said. I think it's, it's, it's changed. Yeah, you know? for me, I think the first thing is really it's, um, the first gate is the return. Is I, I don't. It, for me, it doesn't matter if you did a six hour Golden Gate Park mushroom experience with the intention of actually diving into yourself or something, or if you went to Peru for like three months. It's not going to be the same, obviously, but the return is going to be because you're going to find something. And if you really want to, if you're doing it from that psycho-spiritual exploration or even a therapeutic lens intention where you want to go deep and you want to like explore, um, something, like you said, something's going to change. And I've seen it in myself and I've seen it so many times where you come back. We have, I think there's what's called the first week or two weeks are like what I call the sparkly period. You come back and you're like really riding that wave of inspiration, of renewal, of um, that, yeah, that, that you touch the ineffable, you touch something much more and everything and you're, you're in it. And you're, so everything feels good and everything feels better and feels really feel optimistic and hopeful. And then slowly that starts to dissipate. And, you know, like we said, ego structures, reality starts to come in. And then the, then the work for, or I should say the challenge, um, the work starts when you come back, but the challenge starts. It's like, okay, now we're moving from, we have to start doing integration and communication. Right? So like a friend of mine who came back, for her, it was like, she really felt disconnected from nature. Uh, she was like, she made a practice for her, which can sound silly, was she found places in Berkeley in nature where she can walk barefoot. Because when she did it, it brought her back to her experience. It brought her back to this connection with the earth that allowed her to find herself inside all this moment. And then from that place of self, she could start asking questions of how do I understand things? What's going on for me? Where is my, what's the next phase of my integration? What do I want to do? But she first had to create this ritual of connection. So I think the first thing is really the return. It's so easy. It's so easy to get sucked in. We, are, we underestimate the, the energetic power of capitalism and our Western society. 
especially in the US. It's so hard. It's so palpable. It's interesting. Every immigrant that I know, every friend of mine who's like even Jenny who's Canadian, every time we go home and come back, we are so aware of the difference. And it even feels like this. I mean, I imagine you have that now because you've been in Peru for a while. Like when you come back, there is you can feel the under the shadowy undercurrents of west of the west kind of like starting to sip in. And it shows up as like, oh, I'm checking my phone more. All of a sudden, more in my emails. All of a sudden, I get lost on Instagram for an hour, which I didn't when I was in the jungle. And I, all these small habits start to kind of creep in again. Um, so there is something about creating a... Uh, when I did my research on integration, one thing that I've learned from the people I interviewed, they all of a sudden, they they worded this theme and they said i realized that there is a process inside that i have to choose to invest more energy so it's like almost like a shifting of your of your focus but the, for me it was the word choice and like they understood that there is a choice i can either keep going or like we said sit up straight and actually be like, no, this, whatever is going on here is more important than what's going on here. So I think that's a big part. It's really choosing to be with yourself with that inner experience. And if you're not surrounded by people who are like-minded, that's going to be challenging. If you have to go and like, you know, wear a suit to work the next day when you come back, that's going to be challenging. Not that there is anything wrong with that world, but there's the potential for that, again, a conflict. Because you're going to ask to do certain things. You're going to ask to be, to take on a role, right? Which is not necessarily conducive to now I need to feel like I need to go, I need to walk barefoot. Or like, I'm in the midst of this intense liminal experience and space that I need to like, I'm feeling all these things. You might not be able to share it with your coworkers, so you're gonna have to sit with it for yourself. And that's where it becomes really challenging for people. So that's one thing. The other thing that comes to mind is, yeah, your, re your relationships might change. You might not be, my friend told me yesterday, she was like, I'm not interested in going to music shows anymore. And she used to be a huge music show person. Like, this was someone who's, like, huge into it. She's like, I don't know how. And she said, and this is funny, this is someone who's been on the path for a while. She's like, I don't know how to explain it to my friend. I don't know how to tell them that I don't want to go to shows anymore. Because I know they'll have a reaction. They know I'm weird. They know I'm, the, but I know they'll have a reaction. Right? So still, it's like, how do you... <laughs> I remember going back to Israel after my first few experiences and sitting next to my best friend, who I know since I was six, and sitting next to him and trying to describe to him over dinner what I'm experiencing. And midway through, and I'm all excited, kind of like you and your ex. I'm like all excited, and I'm trying to describe these like multi-dimensional experiences and worlds. And, and I'm noticing that I'm there is very little feedback I'm getting from this person. And he looked at me in the end and he's like, you are speaking alien to me. I have no idea what you're talking about. And it felt like such a painful rejection. I remember, I remember feeling so hurt because I couldn't understand how he's not experiencing what I'm experiencing or at least how he's not curious about it. I mean, obviously now I can explain it in very detail, but, and I remember it sent me on this thing that I was like, you know what? I can't share this experience unless it's someone who actually can get it. So it created this isolation. So I think the next thing is changes. It's, you can put out different boundaries with people. You might, relationships might change, but how do not isolate? The biggest feedback we keep getting from no matter how, what workshop we do is, oh my God, the community factor was so powerful and meaningful for my process. 
it's not about the wisdom, it's less about that, less about, it's like the fact that people were connected, let's go back to intimacy, felt intimately connected. They brought their vulnerable, soulful self and they felt resonance and connection with other people. And it dissolved this feeling of isolation, of shame, and of feeling misunderstood. So I think that that's the other thing is finding, yeah, let alone having relationships change, but also the importance of find, find people, find your village. It can be uh, someone like, you know, like you or I, it can be a person that you work with that is experienced, but also like find a community. There are so many communities out there. Um, and then I think, like we said, when you are going through a liminal space, things are really weird and challenging. And, you know, if you really want to change, usually when things are weird or challenging, you know, for some people, maybe your the way to deal with it was watch TV or go out drinking run or but things that are more avoidance based than connection based like let me connect to my discomfort let me be in the liminal space and not know so in a way it's a great to reconnect to where we started which is it's about okay like i find myself having this conversation a lot with people it's like what space do we need to create for you? do you need to go say, like take a bath three times a week to sit in warm water where you feel held, immersed, like almost like embryonic fluid. So your nervous system gets calm. Not just taking a bath, it's a whole ritual. You need to go, oh, oh. I've had people who, you know, are more, um, who are kind of already had some kind of spiritual practice and they would go and just lay at their altar. Just look at all these things and feel. We'll go to a place where they feel their connection to spirit and do that. And I think the biggest thing is if you're working with plants, okay, what did the plants teach you? Bring the plants. Can you call on uh, tobacco? Are you going to go smoke that mapacho and pray before and ask for guidance, ask for clarity, ask for help, bring the plant with you? Right again, so here's back into that theme of intimacy. The dieta doesn't end when you get out of it. That's just right, that's just the beginning. At least in that from what I it's like this, it's this ongoing relationship. Right? And then that's why I see people actually maybe if you want to kind of touch on it later, Jason, but that's where I see when I remind this to people, they're like, oh right. This is where West and indigenous kind of have this like friction. It's like, yeah, the plants are this live entity you are in relationship with, ongoing. The archetypes you met in your psychedelic experience are still here. They're not delegated to that vision you have when you were taking like DMT or LSD or whatever that is. Keep working with them. Bring them back. What wisdom did they give you? Can you keep working with the wisdom? Integration is not about conclusions. A lot of people think that integration is about an explanation mark. Integration is about keeping things open. Again, open and open and deepening and more layers and more layers. Right? What happens if I go and have a conversation with tobacco three times a week because that's what I need? I go outside, I pray, I connect. I ask for them to come in because I don't know what's happening. So it's really, it's bringing that back. And it's really amazing to me to see how a lot of people, it like hits them like lightning that that's even a possibility. Although they felt it so strongly when they were in that experience. And it's such a huge resource, a profound resource, because you don't feel alone. And you're, again, you're reconnecting with that spiritual with your, you know, to, not to sound cliche, but with that, that teacher ally. Um, so yeah, to really keep that process open. 
And then eventually, when the time comes, obviously, it's, uh, you know, it's how do we move to implementation? If I finally land somewhere in my integration process, that's like, okay, you know, like, I want to quit my job. I, you know, I talked to, I interviewed people who were like, broke up uh, engagements and, you know, like worked in the job and they're like, I need to go live in the forest for two years. Like, okay. That can feel so challenging, right? Like we said, the ego can start. The known version of self can really panic. Wait, 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 wait. What do you mean you're breaking this marriage? What do you mean you're quitting job? What are we going to do for money? How are we going to survive? How are we going to do right? No hope. No, it's the fear starts to kick in. And it's like being, right? So there it's how do we, it's okay to listen to that, but not again, like constrict. So, but let me, if you don't mind me asking you, Jason, though, how do you, how do you remind your people to kind of reconnect with the plants, um, to reconnect with the plants, to bring back that, that, that energy, that process is ongoing. It's not, it doesn't end in, in the tambo, you know, and <laughs> when you do the last, the, the closing of like, the energetic, Again, I think you put it really well, and also that idea of, of really listening to the heart, uh, using that as guidance. Mm. Um, I mean, there, you know, there, there's not, a, a, also as you were pointing towards, there, there's not like a set path for everyone. I mean, everyone's going to be different in their path and what they need, and some people come out of it and they're like, I feel amazing. Like uh, life is beautiful and, and everything seems to be laid forth for them. And, uh, and other people that can be very challenging. It can stir up all sorts of stuff. And, and there's, there's that process of implementation and uh, okay. Like these plans showed me a lot of things and now I need to take the action and start to do them. And it's, it's not going to be easy. Some of these things may be really difficult. Um, but I, I think more than anything is just that listening to the heart and, and, um, you know, definitely, as you said, there, there's, there's tools we can use, whether that's, uh, I mean, it can be really simple things like many people have never cared for a plant before. Maybe that's putting a plant on their windowsill and <laughs> just caring for it. And, and maybe it's something that grow grows, it's an herb. And then they start to use that herb in their cooking or, um, definitely something like mapacho can be a really beautiful tool to, to really create a ceremony around that. Um, if it's other plants, people have worked with maybe coca, you know, just having a little bit of that every day, or just, I think going, going on, on walks in nature and really, I think one of the, the amazing things that a lot of these plants do is, because that, that process of doing a ceremony or a dieta, there, there's really common, again, archetypes in that. Things like isolation, fasting, uh, being in nature, uh, being with oneself. There, there's a tremendous power in that, uh, regardless of ingesting a plant. That's like the, the icing on the cake in a way. But even just those, those little practices can be tremendously beneficial. And I think so many people what they experience when they, they, they come, let's say to the Amazon is, is it, it's such a, it's such a shift for so many people just being in the jungle and, and falling asleep to the noise of, of the animals. And, you know, some people even they, they can't sleep the first two nights. Cause they're like, Oh my God, like, it's like a, just a cacophony of sound. And <laughs> sounds like things are killing each other outside of my tombo And, um, but then they fall into this like deep, beautiful sleep of just experiencing that. And it's, um, you know, there, there's always, I think this argument of like, what is nature? And, and, and I think sometimes we, we see ourselves as separate from nature. I think a lot of people would argue that even cities are, are part of nature, but 
but I think it's difficult to argue that that one feels the same in in a city as they do in in a in a in an environment where there's trees growing and where they can see animals and when they can hear that and when they're breathing air that's not contaminated and uh, you know, it's not to say living in the city isn't beautiful. It's, it's amazing. It offers so many rewards uh, culturally and, and communities. Um, but uh, so uh, again, I think it goes back to this balance uh, about yeah. harmony. And, and, and I think for so many people, it can be super beneficial, as you said, like with your friend, just to, to find a spot to take your shoes off and, and, and connect on the earth and feel that. And Ultimately, I think what these plants are pointing towards is 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 some sense of of, of harmony, of union, of connection, mm-hmm. of love, and and it's really just about finding whatever that is in our lives. And and I think the more we we can open to that and to find that, we begin to find this quality of peace, of joy. And you know, it's really funny because often. Um, people will come down and they're like, well, you know, what is this medicine all about? And uh, they'll ask like a, you know, Shipibo healer, like, what is this medicine all about? And they're kind of expecting like, well, it's to communicate with aliens or to go to the 12th (laughs) dimension or, uh, you know, to, to be able to levitate or, you know, to, (laughs) you know, all of these ideas. And, and they, they very often get really shocked when the answer is, is something like to be happy. You know, that's, that's the answer. It's to be happy, <laughs> to, 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 to be able to laugh like we laugh. And, uh, and, and so I, I think, you know, it, it's a big process of, of falling away, of, of insights, of going into the darkness, of experiencing the light, experiencing connection, beauty, awe beyond our wildest connection, fear, terror beyond our wildest uh, you know, being seen things that we could never maybe even dream of, of experiencing things that, that maybe don't make sense. And and yet all of that, as you said, it's coming back to the here and now where it's, okay, how do I, how do I take that and integrate that? How do I, how do I find happiness? How do I take these lessons and really apply them to my life? And that's going to look really different for different people. And yet I think there's, there's commonalities. It's, you know, in a way it's like returning home. And, and what does that mean? What does it mean to be at home? What does it mean to, to find peace, to, to find connection, to see the value of, of friends, of family, of, of lovers, of, of, of creating life, whether that's through literally creating life or, 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 or having a garden or, you know, taking care of animals, taking care of community, you know, all of these things, which are actually what it means to be a human. So the, the, the integration work, I think it's super important. And I, I think that's why, you know, having people like you is, is very important uh, because uh, people, people need a lot of help and a lot of support. And, and, and that, that's where I think a lot of these roles come in. And, uh, you know, also more in the role I find myself in, it's more of the role of, of, of the work itself. Like, how can I do that work the best itself so that, you know, hopefully someone doesn't need integration, <laughs> but knowing that almost assuredly everyone will in some capacity and, and however that is. And, and so that hopefully then there's people like you who can help in that stage of the journey. And, and um, you know, I think that's, that's the, the beauty about these roles is, is what, what, what do we do? Role. Where are we, you know, what, what is our work? And uh and I think, you know, any of us, when we do that well, then we, we give people a, a beautiful opportunity to, to really experience the, the beauty and the magic of, of, of this work. <laughs> I think that's the exclamation. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's probably good because I, speaking of work, yeah. I actually have some, some people I need to look work. after, but... Uh, Ido, man, this is this has been a pleasure. It's always it's always really a pleasure. It's interesting because most of the people I've had on here, I, I I've known before. They're they're friends or people I've worked with. But you were you were introduced to me through Diana, and uh, and I, I felt a really beautiful connection right away. And and so it was a pleasure to have you back on. And uh, 
um, you, you do a beautiful job of expressing yourself. And, and so I really thank you and uh, thank you for sharing. And, and some of these topics sometimes can be a little triggering for people. So I hope people really, uh, you know, take, take everything we say with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, but with a grain of salt and, and <laughs> if you're triggered, you know, you've got an opportunity to kind of look at it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, yeah. Jason. And I feel the same. I definitely feel a resonance with you and what you do and how you, yeah, you articulate your being in the world. And, and I can't wait to meet in person. And thank you for having me again. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I feel like we could do another three hours. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> we'll have to do it again. In part three. <laughs> <laughs> If um if people are interested in in reaching out to you about your work or anything, how how can they go about doing that? So yes, uh, thank you. The best way is either through um, you can direct email me. It's uh, i d o c o h e n dot therapy at gmail dot com, or Instagram is the integration circle. That's where we put a lot of our work and both information and psychoeducational, but also all the workshop offerings we have for preparation and specifically integration of any expanded states. It's not necessarily dedicated to ayahuasca, but psychedelics or plants or anything of that. Um, yeah, we usually do monthly integration circles. Um, we're, we're doing now, we just started a six month integration circle, which would be fascinating for us. Yeah, very excited for that. Um, but yes, either through that or through Instagram or Facebook, same thing, that integration circle. Okay, great. Well, I'll put all those up in the show notes and uh, I wish you well, my friend. And I, I think of you thank as a brother you. now and thank you so much for sharing. And uh, and I look forward to the next time we do this. And, and like you said, hopefully meeting in person too. That would be amazing. Me too. Amen. <laughs> all right. Take care, my right. friend. You too. All right, everybody, that is it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ido. Uh, I actually really enjoyed sitting down and talking with him. It was, for me, a really interesting conversation. Uh, I think these are some really important and interesting ideas that we discussed. Um, so I hope you all got a lot out of that. Um, as always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Uh, Patreon is a really beautiful option. Uh, it's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can sign up. Um, and there's some really nice perks you can get back with that, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. So if you're able to do that, I would uh, deeply appreciate that. To all the people who have done that, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate all the support. Um, also, uh, with uh, YouTube now, there's the option to join the channel. You'll probably see a little join button below the video, and that basically works just like Patreon, but via the format of YouTube. Um, if you're not able to do that, as always, subscribing to the show is a really big help. Uh, sharing the show with friends, getting the word out there. Um, with the YouTube version, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bells, liking the videos, that's a really big help with the algorithms. And if you're listening via the audio format, um, Apple Podcasts is still the biggest one. So uh, following the show and leaving a starred rating and a short review is always a really big help. So I think that's it. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the order of the following guests coming up, uh, but I actually uh, have some really good guests on the horizon that are scheduled. So I think you all will really enjoy the upcoming guests. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for the support. And I will see you all on the next episode.
Doom.